You all remember Mary the First of England, also known as Mary Tudor and Bloody Mary. She is remembered for her extension after Henry the Eighth, her Catholic faith, her marriage to the Spaniard Philip the Second, and of course her persecution of Protestants in England. We turn now to the 1550s, as Mary is nearing the end of her life. You called me, Your Majesty. Indeed I did. For what purpose, Your Majesty? To convey to you my glorious news. I'm pregnant, I am. Indeed you are, Your Majesty. Enough of you. Out. In fact, Mary was not pregnant. She was under so much pressure, both from herself and from others, to produce a male heir, that she experienced two so-called phantom pregnancies. Some historians think that these pregnancies were actually cysts or stomach cancer, but Wikipedia thinks that the pregnancies were most likely psychological. After her second phantom pregnancy, in 1558, Mary remained quite ill. Her condition continued to worsen until, on November 17th, 1558, she passed away. She took with her the end of Catholicism in England. Mary's death, as well as her life, were very important events in England's history. In life, she opposed England's then recent switch to Anglican Protestantism, instead favoring Roman Catholicism. In death, she stopped doing these things. In fact, the timing of her death was truly inconvenient for her cause. But it leaves us wondering, what would have happened if Mary had ruled and lived for a longer time? Well, you're about to find out, because you're watching Wild Speculation with Lucas Smith. came to be known as Bloody Mary. But in case you don't, let me fill you in. Henry VIII was the second Tudor monarch. To make his divorces legal, he split the Church of England from the Pope. However, he still considered himself and England Catholic. When he died in 1547, his son Edward VI came to power. Edward started to take England in a direction away from Catholicism, towards a more separate religious path. His religious ideas were just starting to take hold when he died in 1553. Lady Jane Grey then took the throne, but didn't matter because she was only queen for nine days. At that point, Mary ascended to the throne. A Catholic, she strove to return England to Catholicism. She renewed heresy acts which Henry VIII had cancelled, and pursued a harsh policy of killing Protestants. But that all those things really happened. You can look them up. But that's not why you're watching me today. No. You want to see the alternate history. What could have happened if Mary hadn't died and had ruled for a lot longer? Well, here that comes. We now join Mary as she's meeting with Pope Paul IV. I truly appreciate your efforts to help the Protestant problem, Queen Mary. I know how hard it is to be righteous in England, and I think you are doing a great thing. Thank you, Your Holiness. I believe it is not too late to steer England back in the right direction. No. It is not. I am thankful that you are trying to bring the true and worthy religion of Catholicism back to England. I would like to offer my military and political support. With all due respect, Your Holiness, I decline your offer. I am confident that England can handle this problem ourselves. And they did. The Marian persecutions continued. And many Protestants were burned at the stake. But Mary was successful, and by 1565, England was once again a Catholic state. Next up, an event that happened both in actual history and in our alternate history, Mary's wedding. Mary's wedding was very important because it both set up diplomatic alliances and gave her an opportunity to produce an heir. Queen Mary, your royal court and I think it time that you should be married. 
And upon whom do you propose this honor be bestowed? Upon Edward Kootenay. He's the Earl of Devon, and he would make a wonderful husband. And of course, a marriage to him would keep the bloodline pure. Oh, I think that marriage would be a mistake. Prince Philip of Spain has proposed marriage to me. I'd much rather marry Philip than marry Edward. But a marriage to Philip would taint the royal bloodline. Your subjects may no longer accept you. Oh, the Anglicans already hate me. There would be so many benefits of a marriage to Philip, both religious and political. I will marry Philip, and that is that. Mary and Prince Philip were wed in 1554. Philip was crowned King of Spain two years later. In actual history, he outlived Mary by 40 years. You probably remember King Philip II, because he was important in another part of Spanish and English history. The Spanish Armada. The Spanish Armada was a heavily armed, efficient, and large fleet of warships commanded by Philip II. In actual history, Philip II commanded the fleet against England after Mary's death in an effort to stamp out the Protestants in England and the Netherlands. Unfortunately for Spain, the Armada was damaged by storms and collisions with shore, and returned to Spain defeated, having lost some ships. Yes. <laughs> the Spanish Armada was used against England in a response to Elizabeth's return to Protestantism. However, if Mary had lived longer, England would have been Catholic, eliminating this motivation for the Crusade. Also, King Philip II, who commanded the Armada, was married to Mary I, and was actually considered the King of England. So, it's safe to assume that he wouldn't have attacked England. We now join the two English monarchs in this archival footage, dated 1587. You have done well with the Protestants in your country, Mary. I'm glad that you followed Catholicism, even when your people didn't. But now what's left for me to do? With all the Protestants gone, it seems like the world is perfect again. No! El mundo no es bueno! We must rid the entire world of Protestants. But how? Both of our countries are Catholic. Portugal is Catholic. France is Catholic too. What's left to convert? The Netherlands, of course. If we can wipe the Dutch completely off the map, the entire West will follow the one true religion. And of course, we'll get back at them for fleeing from the Spanish. But we can't just march straight into the Netherlands. As we speak, they're gaining more and more territories over sea. They are much stronger than their small size suggests. Back at home, in Spain, we are constructing a massive armada. It is far more powerful and faster than any fleet ever built. My father, Henry VIII, also created some fast, powerful ships for the Navy Royal. If we combine forces, our navies will be unstoppable. So, the Spanish Armada and the Navy Royal worked together, systematically destroying Dutch ships which were used to defend, trade with, and establish colonies. Once, once Dutch colonialism had been defeated, the navies and standing armies of the two countries closed in on the Netherlands themselves. After a decisive victory, control of the Netherlands was returned to Spain, and the people were converted to Catholicism. We did it, Mary. We conquered the West. It was a long struggle, but it was worth it in the end. But what do we do now? We still have an incredibly strong navy. I say we put a naval presence in the Baltic Sea. If we can control that region, we will be the most powerful force in the world. Good idea. The Spanish Armada and Navy Royal were commissioned to promote Anglo-Spanish interests in the Baltic Sea. These efforts were very successful, greatly hindering Sweden's rise to prominence by limiting its access to ports and supplies. As in actual history, Mary and Philip failed to produce a male heir, so Mary was succeeded by her half-sister Elizabeth. Elizabeth only ruled a short time before her death, but the Catholic legacy stayed with England, as did the naval presence in the Baltic Sea and other coastal waters. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Wild Speculation. Until next time, I'm Lucas Smith, signing off.